Good to see you today. If we've never met before, my name is Jonathan, and my wife Natasha and I are the lead pastors here at Experience Church. And today, like every weekend, we are here in Calgary Southwest. We're live in the Northwest. We're downtown, and we're with our brand new small group meeting in Fort McMurray. Can we just, from the Southwest, can we welcome everybody? Say hello. Love that we get to be in many places at once. And today, I'm not even going to waste your time talking about sports or what I ate last night. I'm gonna, we get, we're talking about sex all day. And so we're going to get right to it because um, nobody, I, I don't want to wait. So First John, story of every youth group guy ever. I don't want to wait. Okay, First John, <laughs> that is the struggle. Poor Pastor Tay has his work cut out for him. First John, one. Verse 5, to, is that inappropriate? Uh, 5 to 7, it's going to get worse. Okay. This is the life-giving message we've heard him share, and it's still ringing in our ears. We now repeat his words to you. God is pure light. You'll never even find a trace of darkness in him. If we claim that we share life with him but keep walking in the realm of darkness, we're fooling ourselves. So many of us in the area of sex, love, and romance are fooling ourselves. We're fooling ourselves ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we keep living in the pure light that surrounds him, we share unbroken fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, continually cleanses us from all sin. Continually cleansed. Love that. Let's pray together. God, thank you um, that you're here today. And God, we're here, and so that's a powerful combination. We just open our hearts up, ask that you'd speak to us. God, help us to understand fully God, your plan and the power of sex, love, and romance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, um, my wife has been away for what feels like an eternity. Uh, turns out it was only one night. <laughs> uh, and it's just not fair, right? Because she expects that when she goes away, I'm going to be able to cope as well as she does when I go away. But we were created different, <laughs> And so, like, for me to get through one night, I'm praying harder, I'm fasting, I'm bribing my children, I'm buying them things they don't need so that they love me. Like, it's just, and, and I'm, I'm doing basically anything I can do to survive my time alone. And so, alone. I mean, I had four kids with me, but essentially alone. It's like, anyways. So, I took them yesterday to one of those overpriced kids play places. And, um... Now, it's so, I mean, I'm walking, I, I get to the counter, and I, I got four kids, give their ages, and they ring up the price. I'm like, this is not an amusement park. <laughs> there are no rides. <laughs> there's no mechanical equipment. There's, no, there's, there's nothing. It's so expensive, but then I, I go in, and it's packed, like the joke's on me, and all of these suckers in there, you can't bring in your own food. So my kids told me, Dad, we can't even bring in our own water bottles. I'm like, what is this place? Like, is it a concentration camp? Is it prison? Like, what is happening? They're like, no, Dad, no water. So I get in there. We're in there, like, literally. I paid 60 bucks to get my kids into this stinking playground, and we're in there for five minutes. So like, Dad, we're so thirsty. And I'm like, okay, guys, there's water somewhere. Go find water. And they, they, like, they stopped playing 10 minutes. They're just walking the outer perimeter of the space looking for a fellow to come back. One of them's like welling up. Dad, my throat hurts so bad. And there's no fountains here. I said, well, we're here. And we paid to be here. And you don't have in and out privileges. So just suck in some saliva. Let it coat your throat and keep playing. And eventually I went and bought them an overpriced bottle of water. And we like, literally, we rationed it out. I had one 500 milliliter bottle, and I'm letting them take like, like little sips, like every, every 15 minutes. Not anymore. There's not enough, honey. There's not enough. Like we're preparing for a zombie apocalypse. And uh, so, so, so I told them this is, we were going to go to this place, and they, um, they were amped. Obviously, they got, they said, okay, Dad, we're going to get ourselves dressed. We'll be ready in a few minutes. Said, All right, that's fine. So they went. They got themselves dressed. They come down into the kitchen where we're you know, getting ready to put our coats on, and they're in all black. Like, everybody's all black, okay? All black, and they got, they got their hoodies on. I'm like, okay, that's cool. I mean, we're kind of an, like an all-black fashion family, so that's cool. I like this. It's, my kids have caught it. And um, so we get, we get to the playground thing, and, uh, and we go inside, 
And we're just getting set up. I got a comfortable chair, pull out my laptop, going to do a little bit of work while they play. And, uh, and they start, they all take off their hoodies. And it, they went all like early 90s crisscross. Like anybody? Mac, daddy, make it jump, jump. Crisscross will make it. No, okay. Uh, okay, a few people. We got a few people. Thank you, Chad. Uh, and everybody over 35, <laughs> really pumped. Um, they start turning their, their sweaters around backwards. And so they get their sweaters all on backwards. And I'm like, guys, what are you, uh, what are you doing? And my, my oldest, she says, Dad, here's the plan. Um, we're going to go into the laser tag room where it's dark. We pull the hoods up over our faces. And then we stand in the dark and we don't move. And when other kids come in, the Lambert Four jump and yell at them. I said, <laughs> I said honey, God has gifted you with a creative spirit and leadership abilities to see things and to lead people. I fully support this activity. And so I released them into the laser tag. And you can see there's like the little TV monitor outside where you can kind of see the shapes. But like inside, it's pitch black. And I'm just sitting in my chair watching. There's like these, these all black figures standing against the wall. These other unsuspecting kids walk in. And my kid's like, Wah! And there's all, all these kids are running out of the laser tag with tears in their eyes. And I was so, I was so proud. I was watching like, I love you guys. You're amazing. Lambert Four. Like it was so incredible. And I watched over and over and, and there were parents that like, <laughs> you know, there are parents that come to console their children. Then all, then all of my kids who look like common thieves come out of the, the laser tag area and they come over for their ration of water and the parents are looking at my kids because they're not taking their hoods off. So they're walking out in the dark. And, uh, and, you know, I know I was getting judged and I know you might even be sitting there thinking, well, that's not a very good dad move. You shouldn't encourage that kind of behavior. You're jealous because your kids did not think of it. I, listen, I don't... I, Pink shirt day. I don't think anybody should be bullied, but um, it was funny. <laughs> and it wasn't pink shirt day, so that was, that was earlier in the week. And um, turns out, though, that if you send your kids into a dark room and encourage them to put dark hoods over their face, reducing their visibility to nothing, that if they run in that dark room, there's going to be problems. And so as much as I was entertained watching everyone else's children come out of the room with tears in their eyes, there was a moment I had my headphones in. The novelty had kind of wore off. It had been like an hour. And so I'm sitting there just doing some work, and, and, uh, and I don't hear or see my two youngest children come out screaming, holding their heads, crying their faces off. So not only was I the dad that was watching everyone else's children get mistreated, but then I was neglecting my own when there was an issue. <laughs> And so they come out, and finally they, like, get over to me, and it's just, ah, ah. Again, turns out, if you let them run completely blindfolded in a dark room, and they hit each other, it hurts. <laughs> and so we had a pretty significant collision. My one, I won't tell you which one, one of them still has a bit of a lump there, and it'll go away, I'm sure. Mild concussion, it's fine. And uh, <laughs> so... As, as that happened, I just, I got to thinking, this is basically us when it comes to sex, love, and romance. I mean, basically what's happened is that many of us, and, and this is the byproduct of the culture and the context that we live in, we are running around in the dark and we continue to hurt each other over and over and over again. When we are blind to what God really says and what God really has for us in the area of sex, love, and romance, all we are doing is, is running into each other and bringing more hurt and more destruction. And, and when we don't know the truth, it's really impossible to find our way. And so for the most part, we've got great intentions, but no real sense of direction. How do I... How do I find fulfillment? How do I find wholeness? How do I find peace? How do I find um, what God really has for me? And the more we try and figure this out in the dark, the more we're hurting each other. It's the blind leading the blind. And like the text from 1 John tells us, if we're in the light, it's unbroken relationship and a cycle of grace. But when we're in the dark, it's broken relationships and a cycle of guilt. And so today we're not just... You know, this, the title of this series has been, it ha, is Sex with the Lights On. 
And, uh, but we're, we're going to get right into it today because, you know, the week one, we sort of talked about, talked about God and creation and created purpose. And we talked about, like, our character and then the character of the people we should be looking to have relationships with. No, no, no. Today, I'm coming, like, right to your front door. We're going to sit down. We're going to have the sex talk, like, the talk. The awkward one. My, I think my parents gave me a, pre- if mom and dad, if you're watching, I love you. I think they gave me a precious moments Bible. <laughs> Figure it out, son. You'll be fine. Okay. And <laughs> precious moments. Who does that? Uh, if you didn't grow up in church, don't worry about it. It's, uh, you don't need to. Okay. And we, got, we have to talk about this because every single person in the room today has some unhealthy, preconceived ideas about sex, love, and romance. We're almost programmed to think wrong. And, and, and so, m- for the most part, our first impressions of sex, love, and romance are negative in some capacity. I like to call this the head and shoulders principle. Does anybody remember those commercials? You meet the girl of your dreams... She sees a little bit of dandruff on your shoulder. This is like, think back, people. We're talking late 80s, early 90s. She sees some dandruff on your shoulder. Only a few flakes. But then she walks away, and what was going to be a budding romance has turned into nothing because of your dandruff issue. And the slogan is you never get a second chance to make a first impression. For many of us, our first impressions on sex, love, and romance were negative. Uh, Again, the vast majority of us maybe. Maybe we got exposed to it too young. Maybe we engaged in it prematurely. Perhaps it was the wrong people, the wrong crowd. Maybe somebody abused you and took advantage of you and forced you into a sexual experience that you weren't ready for and weren't looking for. Maybe all of your education happened on the playground and then you just figured it out. Maybe it was Playboy. Maybe it was in the back of a car. I mean, and and to be honest, um, you know, for, for people like me, uh, my age, it's, it was a lot easier to avoid sexual things 25, 30 years ago. Now, I mean, it's everywhere. So your first exposure might have been a pop-up, might have been a sex message, might have been um, f- uh, something on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat. or Like, it's so accessible. I mean, it was really hard. But Like, when I was 12, it was very difficult to find pornography. I only know that I told, told uh, one of our services a few weeks ago that my first exposure was at about 12 years old. Uh, we found a Playboy magazine in a bush on the way home from school. And at first I looked at it and I was terrified. And then I went back the next day with my buddy and we looked at it again. And then I thought Jesus was going to come down himself and strike me dead. And then I went home and said, Dad, we found a Playboy in the bushes. And my dad almost struck me dead. And then we got rid of the magazine. It's a lot. Listen, it, it's a lot easier and a lot more accessible now. And for, for many of us, our first exposure has been unhealthy. And all of these things, no matter what your first exposure was, they feed our minds, they, they shape our hearts, how we feel and understand. And, and the issue with culture and its perspective on sex, love, and romance is that it's viewed through a, a very lustful lens. And so it's, it's a physical thing. I've got these desires. They need to be satisfied. And we're almost, in many cases, a slave to our feelings and our desires. It gets viewed through the context of lust. Now, unfortunately... Church may have been your first exposure, and for a lot of us, that wasn't any better. It, the message that you may have received growing up in church or growing up in youth group was that um, sex is uh, it's negative, it's dirty, and you save it for marriage, which is like why so many people get, Christian people get married, and they're like, really, this is, how, we, how do we do this? It's been, I've been told it's awful my entire life. Wrong. Awesome. And see, so where culture looks at sex and tries to filter it through the context of lust, the church has historically done so through the context of legalism, and both are far from what God has planned for us. Far from it. The truth about sex is that sex is powerful, but context is king. So when something is powerful, it can be used powerfully for the good, or it can be used powerfully in a destructive manner. Context is is everything. I'm going to ask Pastor Kyle to come up, and I think Eris, are you helping me? Okay, good. If not, I'd appreciate it if you would. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure that was the plan. Okay, God, God has a context for what sex is supposed to look like. And so, Pastor Kyle, you're right there. Eris, you can come right here. So what I've done today is I've decided to use um, Fruit Loops as a 
portrait of sex. Okay, it's a picture of sex. I mean, everyone, like Fruit Loops are fantastic. They're full of sugar. They give you a bit of a buzz. Um, they're good morning, noon, and night, just like sex, okay? So it really is a snack that works at all times. All right. Okay. So here we've got, um, here we've got Eris and Eris. Uh, so this is sex. This is context, okay? God has a planned design, a container, a context for which we should be experiencing sexual intimacy. Okay, so Eris, I'm just going to, it looks a little dusty in there, but trust me, it's fine. Just bacteria. You've got a strong immune system. Um, so we're just going to give Eris some Fruit Loop. Do you like Fruit Loops? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's good. Because if you don't like Fruit Loops, you don't like sex. Okay. Just kidding. Just kidding, but it would have been really bad if you didn't like Fruit Loops. The whole thing would have fallen apart. We would have needed another volunteer. Okay, so here's Eris who got his Fruit Loops in their proper context. And then we just give him a little bit of milk here. And Eris, I'd like you, in the context of your wonderful married relationship, to enjoy some Fruit Loops, please, everybody. Eris, enjoying his Fruit Loops. In proper context, and you know what? Because they're in proper context, you can have as much as you want. So just keep going and going and going and going. Look at his stamina. Okay. That's what I'm going to ask you. That was, I shouldn't have said that. (laughs) I told you when we started, it was only going to get worse. (laughs) Okay, Pastor Kyle, put put your hands out like this. Okay, so here we go, Pastor Kyle. Do you like Fruit Loops, Pastor Kyle? Okay. It's going to give you... Some Fruit Loops, okay, fantastic. Pastor Kyle, I'm gonna put some milk on your Fruit Loops here. Uh, Pastor Kyle, would you just eat some Fruit Loops? Okay, here we go. Fantastic. How do they taste? They taste, great. they taste great. Now here's the point. Go ahead, continue to eat as much as you'd like. Here's the truth with sex. In the moment, it tastes great. In God's context, it doesn't make a mess. And sex outside of God's context will make a mess in your life that you were cleaning up for years because you ignored his design. You can keep going. I mean, don't feel, you're done? Okay, you can just, draw. that's fine. Here, I got some wipes for you too. Listen, it, inside God's context, it tastes great, it's wonderful, and it's not gonna mess your life up. Outside of God's context and his plan and design, it might taste good in the moment, but it's going to create a mess that you will have to deal with at some point, I promise you. You will have to deal with it. Can you give it up for these guys? That's great. You can leave, you can leave that there. That's good. What is God's context? What, what is the bull that God gives us for healthy sexual relationship. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 11 in the message says this, don't you realize that this is not the way to live? Unjust people who don't care about God will not be joining his kingdom. Those who use and abuse each other, use and abuse sex, use and abuse the earth and everything in it, don't qualify as citizens in God's kingdom. A number of you know from experience what I'm talking about. For not so long ago, you were on that list. The NIV gives a little more direct language to it. It says, don't be deceived. Don't fool yourself. Neither the sexually immoral nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, slanderers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. There is a context for healthy sex, love, and romance. God's context is one man plus one woman in marriage and then having great sex. Oh, Pastor Jonathan, that's so old school. Nobody thinks that way anymore. Well, maybe they should. Pastor Jonathan, it's too late for me. If I had known that 15 years ago, then things would be different. But I got cereal and milk all over the place. It's messy for me. I'm broken. I've made mistakes. I've got a string of broken relationships. 
I don't feel like I know I'm supposed, I've got guilt and shame. I've already done it the messy way. I've already seen things I shouldn't have seen. I've been exposed to things I never should have been exposed to. I've done things the wrong way. Some of it wasn't even my fault. So I, I just, it's too late for me. I love what it says at the end of this passage in 1 Corinthians. It says, since then, since then. So you may have thought that way, and you may be thinking that way right now. Oh, this is irrelevant, or it's too late. But since then, since those moments, you've been cleaned up and given a fresh start by Jesus, our Master, our Messiah, and by our God present in us through the Holy Spirit. This is why we need to have the conversation. Because if we don't talk about it, then all we are in church is a collection of messy, sticky, fruit loop spilled people who are trying to keep our, our issues, our sexual problems in the past and in the dark. And if you keep it in the dark, God is going to cause it to grow and fester and get worse and worse and worse. And it will start to erode your future relationships. It will become baggage that you carry with you into every future relationship. It will rob you of your future. But if we can take a minute and just, just decide in our minds that maybe God's on to something with this context, if we can expose the truth, then we can move forward believing God for the best. Jesus addresses um, a crowd with some sexual issues in John chapter 8. Verse 2, it says, At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. He sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. This is a charged up religious and sexual environment. The religious leaders are trying to capture Jesus in a moral dilemma. They're in the temple courts. It's like when church is over and you go find your campus pastor and you ask him weird questions and expect him to have an answer on the spot. Stop doing that. They find this woman, catch her in the very act of adultery, having sex with a married man. And, and every time I've read this story, I thought it was about the woman until just recently. And I'm reading through the narrative and the conversation that happens, and I realize that if we're just looking at the, con the, the content or the, the amount, the qu quantity of conversation, the religious leaders say 25 words and the woman only says three. And I thought, maybe there's some, some significance there. I wonder if there's more I should know about the religious leaders. And so um, I began to look in deeper into them. And what I saw was that the religious leaders seemed to have two common misconceptions that were prevalent in their day because of, of a sexually confused and unhealthy culture that are also prevalent in our day because of a sexually confused and unhealthy culture. See, the religious leaders lived by the letter of the law in so many areas. They fulfilled all of their prayer requirements. They gave large, large amounts of money to the church. They didn't miss a service. But what we see in this conversation is that they are trying to separate their spiritual life from their sexual life. Because, and, and we know this is happening because in Jewish law, to bring somebody up on charges of adultery required two or more witnesses. So you've got to wonder about what's happening in this crowd. The woman was caught in adultery. Number one, she can't adulter by herself. There was a guy there. And, and all the language points to the fact that he may have been in the group. Number two, she's adultering with somebody. Adultering, I don't even know if that's a word. She's, committing a, she's having sex with someone. And there had to be at least two or more witnesses watching it happen. Who are those perverts? Right? They're standing there in the circle saying, Jesus, what are you going to do with her? They have separated their spiritual life from their sexual life. Listen, they're holding the woman to a different standard than, than they hold themselves to. And we do this all the time. Because it seems to me that the sexual sins that we have the biggest issues with are the ones we don't participate in. 
Oh, come on, let's. But the one you do participate in, there's grace for that. Oh, there's, there's grace for that. No, 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 listen. There's grace for all of it, and you cannot separate your spiritual life from your sex life. It's not God on one side and sex on the other. You can't love Jesus and then do whatever you want with your sex life, ignoring his context. Jesus, I'm, I love you. I'm serving you. I, I love to pray. I love to be in your presence. God's like, yeah, but can we talk about what you're watching on the internet? Oh, God, I... I really need a miracle. You've been faithful before. Would you please be faithful again? Okay, okay yeah, I, I hear you, but can we talk about the emotional affair you're having with that guy at your office? You know, the one who makes you feel good, so you're starting to eat lunch with him every day because he makes you feel good. You've got a husband who's out at his job, but you're hanging out with this guy because he's providing something for you. Come on, let's, let's be real. God, I come to church. I believe in you. I've been coming to church for years. That's great. Can we stop and talk about what happened with Tinderella last night? God, I really know you've got a calling and a purpose for me. Okay, stop sleeping with that boy. He can't commit to you. He's not man enough for you. He hasn't put a ring on your finger and walked down the aisle and made a lifelong commitment. Stop committing to him with your body. Listen, you're either all in with Jesus or you're all out with Jesus. You cannot separate these things. We are creation. He is creator. We're connected. And, and here's the, the thing. Sex was his idea. And we've said this a few times and we'll continue to, to shout this every time we have a series of conversations like this. Sex was not something created by a couple of nasty, perverted people in a dark corner somewhere. Sex was God's idea. Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. This is not the garden channel. God's not just giving them tips on how to grow a flower bed. He said, Adam, wake up. You're naked. Here's Eve. She's naked. Go for it. And then the Brian McKnight starts to play in the background. One, you're like a dream come true. Two, just want to be with you. Three, listen, don't, don't, don't judge my honeymoon playlist. <laughs> Had that loaded up on our MP3 player. Hello. It's plain to see you're the only one. Okay. God made sex for procreation, but he also made it for pleasure. When we got engaged, someone gave us a book called Intended for Pleasure. I never read anything so fast in my whole life. Tell me more. He wants us to enjoy ourselves sexually. That's why it breaks his heart when we make a mess outside of his context. And so there's this idea that somehow sex can be separate from my spiritual life. It's just not true. Then there's also this idea that sex is somehow subjective. That, and this tends to be the, 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 the narrative of our culture that I, I'm going to do what feels right for me. Um, I need to have standards that work for me. I'm going to make sexual decisions based on how I feel. I'm free to do whatever I want. This is about my preferences and my opinions. And so that's where we get things like, but he loves me and I need to show him how much I love him. And so, no, you don't. It's not subjective. The devil wants you to think that sex is subjective, so you will subject yourself to destruction. But 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12 and 13 says, just because something is technically legal doesn't mean it's spiritually appropriate. If I went around doing whatever I thought I could get by with, I'd be a slave to my whims. You know the old saying, first you eat to live and then you live to eat. Well, it may be true that the body is only a temporary thing, but that is no excuse for stuffing your body with food talk about that later, or indulging it with sex. Since the master honors you with a body, honor him with your body. The NIV says, I have the right to do anything, but everything is not beneficial. 
So do you have the right to do what you want with your body? Absolutely. Why? Because God gave you choice. It is the most pure expression, the greatest gift, the most intimate expression of his love for you, that he allows you to choose and doesn't force a way of life on his creation. You can choose to express yourself outside of God's context sexually, but you cannot choose the outcome. Well, well, but I, I, can, I can control the outcome. You might think you can. I can navigate the outcome. You can try. But the, the objective truth is that any sex outside of God's context, a sexual experience outside of the way he's designed it to be held and handled, sexual experience, the outcome is always objective. 100% of the time, sex outside of this leads to this. 100% of the time, every time. It's messy. And if we do it outside of his context, that's what we'll find out. And there's a lot of us dealing with a lot of mess because we've, we've explored these things outside of his context. 100% of the time, it will mess you up. Now, some of you are like, well, I'm married. Like, we're having cereal in the bowl, but it feels more like plain Cheerios or like old oatmeal. What do we do? So I get that. So next week, Natasha and I are going to talk about how to add a little sugar and a little color to the bowl. But listen, so it's not to say that if it's in the bowl, it's perfect. But if it's outside of the bowl, 100% of the time, it's going to be a problem. 100% of the time. Let's just focus on what we know for sure. There are ways you can spice up your cereal. But 100% of the time, it's not in the context. It's going to leave a mark. 1 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17 gives some why. Do you not know that he who, some, some why to the mess. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with, with body, for, with, one in body with her? Now this is important because when he's referring to prostitution, many of us are like, oh yeah, but of course. No, no, no. This, this was, it was an acceptable form of recreational sex in this time and culture in Corinth to have sex with temple prostitutes. So recreational sex for as it is written, two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one in spirit with him. The message says it this way. There's more to sex than just skin on skin. There's more to sex than skin on sin, skin. Since we want to become spiritually one with the master, we must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy in marriage, leaving us more lonely than ever. The kind of sex that can never become one. Translation, there is more to sex than just babies and booty calls. There's more to sex than just pleasure and procreation. And I think that sometimes that's even been our narrow view, that it's for my pleasure and it's so we can procreate. No, no, no. What, what the Apostle Paul is telling us in Corinthians is that sex is about permanence. So recreational sex with someone outside of marriage has long-term relational implications. And part of the problem and the issue is that we have become so over-sexualized in our culture that it's no longer special. There's no mystery to it. But the truth is, sex can become so casual that we have a hard time making it meaningful. And this is the case in a lot of relationships. This is the case in a lot of marriages, which pushes people to unhealthy extremes, trying to find the magic and mystery of sex because it's, we've, been, we've been inundated with it. The truth is that sex reaches beyond your body, grabs hold of your soul, and connects it with another person. It's adhesive. It fuses two people together. Paul says that two become one flesh. He's quoting Jesus from Matthew chapter 19, who happens to be quoting God from the Garden of Eden, says this in Matthew 19. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and two will become one flesh? This united language to the crowd that Jesus is talking to hits home because it doesn't just mean hang out together, come together. It means fused and to start a family. Because when Jesus was over, when God was overseeing and creating the marriage process, it wasn't the cake or the flowers or the decorations that made it official. It was the wedding night that made it official. That's what sealed the deal. And so you can, you've got to understand, you can procreate with a lot of people. And you can find pleasure with a lot of people, but you can only ever be permanent with one. And sex 
is about permanence. When we have sex, our physical lives, emotional lives, and spiritual lives get completely intertwined with another person. And I'm not going to go into all the details. If you want them, you can go back to last spring, our adulting series. But God wired us so that sex would fuse you together with your spouse. That sexual desire wouldn't push you to unhealthy places and extremes. That it would push you together with the person you have committed your life to in the context of marriage. Men, we are pre-programmed to remember in the, con- the context of an orgasm and to be drawn back to that place and that person. Women, you are created for monogamous, a monogamous married sex life to bond to your partner every single time. We're wired that way. So they, verse 6, are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Paul, back in Corinthians, says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. I love this advice from the Apostle Paul. It's great sex advice. It's not parental. Don't have sex um, outside of marriage because I said so. It's parental. It's not sex ed which is be really careful having sex because you don't want to get an STD or a baby you're not ready for. It's not even Sunday school, which is run away. Sex is gross. No, the message from the Apostle Paul is don't do it. Not all sin is created equal. Because when you sin sexually, you're hurting you. You're hurting your true self. You're you're stealing from your future. You're undermining the future intimacy you should have with the person of your dreams. It becomes an obstacle for, for honesty, your heart, your destiny, your emotions, your passions, your calling, your confidence. They take a hit when you have sex outside of his context. It was created for marriage to make people permanent. And when we have it outside of his plan, it hurts us. Sexual experiences are supposed to unite you with your, sp- with your spouse. It hurts us. It's supposed to be an adhesive and like a sticker. Every time you take it off and then put it back on and take it off and put it back on, it's a little less sticky and a little less sticky and a little less sticky. You are meant to be joined. And so every time you join with someone through a sexual experience and then you separate from that person, you leave part of yourself behind, part of yourself with someone who doesn't care for you and hasn't paid a price for you. Well, I, I used to be so confident but then you had a sexual relationship outside of marriage and, and you feel insecure. Why? Because a piece of you broke off. Because you can't separate without leaving something. I used to be so passionate and so full of purpose and now I'm just coasting and I don't know what, I, what I'm living for, right? Because you've had a few sexual partners and experiences and every time you did, another piece of your passion broke off. Understand the the boundaries that God gives us around sex aren't to suppress us and to ruin the fun. They're for our protection. Dr. Henry Cloud on boundaries, phenomenal teacher, says good boundaries defend and protect you. They keep the good things in and the bad things out. And every time we have a sexual experience outside of his context, I believe Jesus is standing there heartbroken watching some of how he created you be left behind with somebody who's not ready to commit to you. And for those of you that think, well, I know I should have boundaries, but I've got a boyfriend and we got to, you know, it's just, it's, we're, we love each other. Or, or maybe, you're, maybe you're divorced and you're 55 years old and you're hooking up with somebody new and you feel like I've been there, I've done that, so it's okay, we know what we're doing. No, 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 listen. The only people who get upset about you having boundaries are the ones who want to take advantage of them. You can tell a lot about the intention of the people that are with you by how they respond to your boundaries. It's for our protection. And in conclusion today, I want to say this, and I, I feel like this needs to be said every single time we talk about the power of sex. That the standard that this church is preaching is not a standard of virginity. What? I've said this before. You can be a perverted virgin. Virginity is a physical concept. The standard for you 
the standard for me, the standard that Jesus sets out for us, the standard that is protected in this context is a standard of purity. And it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter how much sex you've had or not had. It doesn't matter what your status is and, and, and if you're a virgin or not. The only person that can make anybody pure is Jesus. And he's willing to make anybody and everybody pure. Verse 19, 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so so glorify God in your body. I love this from Paul. He's saying, here's the truth, but maybe you just didn't know. Maybe you just didn't understand the implications. Maybe you thought it was just procreation and pleasure. He's saying, but I'm telling you, it's permanent. And you were bought with a price, and it's not too late to start glorifying God with your body. You can walk in truth and receive unbroken relationship and be continually cleansed by Jesus. And what happens to our woman? It says, at this, John chapter 8, she is surrounded by her accusers. Exactly where the devil wants her to be, thinking she's isolated, thinking she's the only one. Thinking she's the only one that's made a mistake, the only one that's had had messy sexual encounters outside of God's design. That's what the devil wants you to think, is that you're alone and nobody gets it, nobody understands. Jesus said, Who, who's, if you're good, then you chuck the first stone. And it says, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing still with him. Guess what? In this room, if we were to ask the same question, there's not a single person who could be left with a stone in their hand. And so know that today, regardless of your sexual history and your trajectory, everything can change because in this moment, we're left standing before Jesus. And it says he straightened up and said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. I love this. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus replied. Go now and leave your life of sin. He levels the playing field. Lady, it's not just you. The whole group, we all have made mistakes. And he looks into her eyes and he says, well, I believe Jesus says to every single person in the room today whose sex life has gotten messy, I don't condemn you either. You've got to know from God's heart to yours, he does not condemn you either. And I love this because Jesus isn't going to jump in and take control of your life, but he's available. So at your request, he will come in and he's such a good savior because he doesn't just leave the mess for us. He starts and he's so willing. He comes over. He says, hey, that's all right. I know you're heartbroken. I know you think that you, you don't deserve love. You don't deserve a second chance. You don't deserve the type of relationship I've designed you for. But guess what? I take broken things and I make beautiful relationships out of them. And it doesn't matter how flawed and final you think this is. I'm telling you, that's just not the way I put things back together. Since then, you have been cleaned up and given a fresh start by Jesus, our master, our Messiah, and by our God present in us. We need a fresh start. And I love how it says, since then, mark the day. It's March 3rd, 2019. It doesn't matter how flawed and messy things have been up to this point. Since then, you're going to be able to look back a year from now and your marriage is going to be healthier. Your relationships are going to be stronger. Because you know what? Since March 3rd, 2019, I've been cleaned up. And that's when I got a fresh start from Jesus, my master and my savior, God present in me. Since then. Since when? today. I'd like you to close your eyes in every location. We're going to pray together. Since then, Jesus, you know that in this room, every single person has sexual baggage. We've made mistakes. We've got flaws. We're broken. We've made a mess of this area of our lives. But God, I pray for every heart right now. Why don't you just at every location, if if this is resonating with you at all, I know it's resonating with me, but you just lift your hands. We're just gonna receive the fresh start of Jesus. I need a fresh start today. 
Go ahead, let's lift our hands all across it, every location, every room. Jesus, I ask right now that, God, this would be our since then moment. That, God, as of today, there'd be no guilt, no shame, no condemnation. You begin to clean up. God, thank you for the cycle of continual grace that you offer to us in this area of our lives. We want to walk in the light of your truth. In this moment, if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, maybe you walked in, you've been trying to figure this out on your own, you've been walking in the dark, you've been separate from him, I want to give you a chance in this moment to start a brand new relationship with him. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three, and you know, you know something, something's happening in your heart. You can't leave this space without getting things right with God. You've made mistakes. You can make it right right now. When I hit three, you slip up your hand, and I'm going to pray for you. Nobody's looking around at every campus, every location. Here we go. One, two. This is you. It's a, you're about to get your life right with Jesus. Three, slip up your hand. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. At every campus, there are hands. Wonderful. You can put your hands down. Would you just repeat this simple prayer after me? Maybe you raised a hand. Maybe you made the decision in your heart. Say, Jesus, I need you. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for doing things my own way. Would you come into my life and begin to clean up my mess? Amen. Amen. Come on, everybody. Can we just give it up for all the people that made that decision today? We're so, so proud of you guys.